So I took a couple of weeks off from Twitter and YouTube and I come back and things are a complete mess. Um, you know, leaving <laughs> YouTube and Twitter, it, it really was nice. Like it, it was therapeutic because I feel like my mind has been cleared. Uh, but every time like there's winter break, there's always some sort of a drama that happens on left Twitter or YouTube. And this year, of course, was no different. I think back in 2017 or 2018, we had the Justice Democrats drama where they kicked out Jenk Uger and then Kyle Kalinske resigned as well. In 2019, we had the Tulsi Gabbard drama. Uh, I was part of that, unfortunately. Uh, and now we have the Force the Vote drama. Now, for those of you who are not aware, I'll try to give you the rundown of it, but basically this turned into this really huge thing that has led to 50% of the left online hating the other 50% of the left online, and it seems like a large portion of people on left Twitter and YouTube now hate members of the squad because ultimately Force the Vote was not successful in getting them to get a floor vote on Medicare for All. It's kind of a mess, but I do feel like after watching way too many hours of Force the Vote uh, material, uh, I've listened to a lot of takes, both from pr proponents of Force the Vote and people who are critical of it. I feel like I do have a pretty solid and objective perspective on this because I've heard out both sides. And so my observations are going to be based largely on generalizations. But I think that what I have to say, I think it's useful. And I, I kind of contemplated whether or not I should even talk about this because I don't I don't want to talk about something that is very clearly dividing the left, which hurts us overall. But I think that in order to move forward, there has to be healing. And in order to have healing, you have to talk about things like you can't just sweep it under a rug. So let's talk about it. So when it comes to force the vote, there's two main camps. One camp, as this uh, image explains, they just simply want progressives to withhold a vote for Nancy Pelosi to become Speaker of the House unless she agrees to, you know, get a floor vote on Medicare for all. Now, baked into this demand is this assumption that we know about the inevitability of Nancy Pelosi. We know that she's probably going to become speaker again because there's no other challenger to the left of Nancy Pelosi. Like, if it's not Nancy Pelosi, it's probably someone worse than Nancy Pelosi to the right of Nancy Pelosi, like Steny Hoyer or Hakeem Jeffries. Um, so knowing that she's going to be speaker again, try to get something out of it. Try to extract some concession, and the concession that we want is a floor vote on Medicare for All. We know it's not going to pass. We know this won't actually get us Medicare for All, but we think we can use this as ammunition to strengthen our position and, you know, have Democrats go on the record, like, show your cards. Who's going to go on the record and deny their constituents Medicare for All during a pandemic? So that's one side. The other side says, hmm... This isn't really a good idea. Now, I've heard multiple takes as to why they think this isn't a good idea. And I'll tell you which camp I fall in after I explain their position. But on Chop Out Trap House, Will Medicare made the point that, you know what? This is just going to hurt our cause because it's going to demoralize people. They're going to see Medicare for All fail and they're going to get disappointed and want to check out of politics. I'm paraphrasing, of course. There are some individuals who will say, you know what, this isn't a good idea because it's going to put us in a worse off position because then Nancy Pelosi can point to the failure of this to pass and she'll say, look, I told you it's not popular. We can't pass it. Um, so overall, after listening to all of these arguments, weighing out the pros and the cons, I ultimately do fall into the camp of force the vote. Ironically, I, I found out about force the vote through Sam Cedar when he talked about Jimmy Dore coming up with the strategy. And I thought, oh my God, this could be something that's amazing because if you have Jimmy Dore and Sam Cedar agreeing on something, two individuals who hate each other's guts, this really could be something that, you know, we all coalesce around and unify the left. But it's turned out to be like the opposite where now everyone hates each other more than ever. And you see people online, Jen Uger, uh, Jimmy Dore taking lots of shots against each other and it is getting ugly i mean that is hard to watch like i've watched these guys over the years and this is like watching two titans in our bubble in our echo chamber go at it it's like you know tupac versus biggie jay-z versus nas and so it's tough to watch and i don't think it needs to be this way uh you know i'm in the camp of force the vote i think that this is a good strategy but i think that we have to acknowledge that there are valid criticisms from allies who definitely support Medicare for All. But when things started to go downhill was when the factionalization really started 
to happen. There was a clip of Jimmy Dore basically screaming at AOC, saying, you know, everyone is turning against you. Humanist Report is now uh, turning against you. Kyle Kalinske is turning against you. And my response to that is, you've got to calm the fuck down, Jimmy. <laughs> like, here's the thing. I don't like the criticisms that uh, Jimmy Dore is just doing this for clicks. He's a grifter. I believe Jimmy Dore believes in this. That's why he's angry. And look, he has a right to be angry. But you've got to acknowledge that if somebody sees, you know, Jimmy Dore screaming at AOC, calling her a sellout, fuck you, you don't support this strategy, it's going to turn off a lot of people and think, okay, this doesn't seem like a good strategy if you're just going to yell at AOC. She's already on our side. From an optics perspective, from a marketing perspective, getting people on board means convincing them. And that's not going to be something that persuades a lot of people. And, you know, after seeing that, a lot of people thought, oh, wow, well, I, I don't want to be associated with this. I don't want to be associated with this dude online who's like screaming at people. And so you had individuals try to kind of salvage the Force the Vote campaign and, and say, look, this isn't really about Jimmy Dore. This is really about Force the Vote, the substance. He's just one individual who is a proponent of Force the Vote. And sure, he popularized it, but you don't have to agree with Jimmy Dore and him screaming at AOC. Uh, to still support force the vote. And that was kind of my take. Like, I think that anger is a good thing, but I don't necessarily agree with like screaming at AOC. Um, I don't think that it's warranted just yet because I don't think that this necessarily proves that she's a sellout because she doesn't support this particular strategy. You know, there's just a disagreement. And apparently her strategy was to negotiate with regard to Pago. But still, even having said that, I think that AOC is wrong to say that, oh, well, Jimmy Dore, she didn't name Jimmy Dore, but it's heavily implied that Jimmy Dore saying fuck you to her is tantamount to violence, which I unequivocally disagree with. Like, I, I think that Jimmy Dore went too far in his criticism of AOC, saying that she's basically uh, comparable to Nancy Pelosi or there's no difference. I don't agree with that at all. But I don't think that telling a politician fuck you or to go fuck themselves is tantamount to violence. But still, even if I don't agree with AOC saying that, I think that Jimmy Dore did take it a little bit too far at times. I think that, you know, when you have forced the vote and people aligning with you, uh, you, you have to acknowledge that there's going to be criticisms even within this faction that has kind of emerged. So there's another viral clip of Jimmy Dore and Ben Spielberg talking about this. And Ben Spielberg tried to push back against this claim that AOC and Pelosi are similar, I think. And Jimmy Dore was yelling at him and, and whatnot. I think that these clips kind of sullied the momentum for Force the Vote. Like, you see a lot of solidarity, but then you think, okay, I don't want to be associated with this. It's getting a little bit too extreme, too divisive. But then people who support Force the Vote, they started to see individuals who were initially supportive of it flip. So you see uh, Jen Ugor, who kind of, like, indicated that he supports Force the Vote, flip and is now critical of it, saying it's it's not the best strategy. Uh, you see Sam Cedar, who initially said he agreed with Jimmy Dore, kind of changed his tune a little bit. I don't know if he was still supportive of the strategy. Maybe he just didn't like Jimmy Dore's tactics and yelling, but he kind of flipped. You see, uh, you know, the DSA come out and say, we don't actually support this campaign, when I believe they supported a, a floor vote on Medicare for All a couple years prior. So if you're an individual and you don't care about these viral clips and you, you care about the substance... Well, it's kind of like, what the fuck? You all supported it. What changed? I mean, now that it's gaining momentum after saying you support it, now you don't support it. So I see that anger. I see why people are disappointed. But on the opposite side of the same coin, folks who are disappointed with individuals who reject this strategy oftentimes take their criticisms way too far. You know, labeling someone a sellout because they don't support this is unreasonable. Putting someone on a list saying that these folks who rejected force the vote are on the wrong side of history, it doesn't make sense. These are all allies who support Medicare for All. They just don't agree with this particular strategy because they don't believe that it's the best way to get to Medicare for All. This is becoming like a no true Scotsman fallacy, where it's like if you don't support force the vote, you're not a real progressive. When that's, it's a strategy disagreement. Like this isn't a hill to die on necessarily because it's just a strategy. I think folks who support force the vote know that this isn't actually going to get us to Medicare for all. It is just a means to an end. It could increase our bargaining power going forward. But of course, there are pitfalls with this strategy. I think there is insightful criticisms of it, but it's not like the hill to die on. Like if you don't support this, I don't support, I don't think you hate Medicare for all or you're a fraud progressive or a grifter. You just disagree and that's fine. Like, I've had my disagreements with people 
who support Medicare for All. I've been disappointed in, disappointed in Jimmy Dore, who when Tulsi Gabbard came out against Medicare for All, you know, he kind of gave her this softball interview and she supported a multi-payer system. She came out with like single payer plus and um, that's plus private insurance. So it's no longer single payer. It's a multi-payer system. It doesn't eliminate, uh, eliminate private insurance. And I was expecting Jimmy Dore to rip her a new asshole, but he didn't. So it's like, well, where was that energy? Where was that fire for Tulsi Gabbard when she came out against Medicare for All? Isn't the standard that you're applying to AOC a lot more stringent and harsh than other politicians? So there are disagreements there. And the problem is that when YouTubers and leftist pundits publicly disagree, then their audiences kind of end up taking a side, you know, and, and so that becomes this huge issue and it becomes a factionalized clusterfuck and, and just a mess. And you've got people who are like making fun of the small crowd size. And that really bothered me as well. If you look at like what the activists there were saying, one of them was Joy Marie, a friend of mine, like she was passionately talking about why she needed Med Medicare for all. So why would we make fun of that? If you disagree with the strategy, there's no need to make fun of that. Like we're all on the same side. And so basically like this is getting already too convoluted, but there's so much. Basically my, my main criticism of force the vote and all of this like both sides is that we don't communicate with each other we're talking past each other we're not talking to each other and so if i vocalize a criticism of force the vote or you know i listen to a criticism of force the vote rather than responding to someone else's criticism i immediately shut down and i think fuck that person i'm done with them i'm writing them off forever and we do this individually because you know there's so much at stake as i stated like there's a lot of anger and hurt and the necessity of Medicare for all, it's never been higher during a pandemic. So there's so much at stake and people have a right to be angry. We just have to make sure we're angry at the right people and being angry at each other, taking shots at each other. This isn't healthy and it doesn't help that YouTubers online are participating in this because their viewers are going to take sides and the viewers will clash when altogether we have to be a cohesive block if we ever want to be successful. And I'm preaching right now, but I've been part of the problem as well. I've gotten into many arguments with people online, uh, other leftist commentators. So we, we just have to try to be more self-aware and not do this. But the main issue here overall, if I could step back and wrap all of this in one pretty package and hand it to you and tell you this is what I think is the main issue here, it's a lack of communication. It's a lack of communication, not just with each other, but between us and politicians, members of the squad specifically, because this is what it's about. So fast forward to the day when all these members of Congress are sworn in and we see whether or not they're going to get anything for voting for Pelosi, because we all expected them to vote for Nancy Pelosi. And what happens? They voted for Nancy Pelosi and we didn't get a floor vote on Medicare for all. So a lot of people responded I think in a reasonable way by saying, look, I get it. You know, I don't want to see them vote for Nancy Pelosi. However, they're going to do that because there's no other left wing alternative. I just hope that they extracted enough concessions to make that vote worth it. Because by voting for Nancy Pelosi, like it or not, you're voting for someone who's part of the problem, who's against your interests. So if you're going to make that choice to vote for Nancy Pelosi, you better damn well get something for it. That's what Force the Vote was about. And then we saw a response that was the opposite, where Fraud Squad was trending and people were attacking members of the squad for voting for Nancy Pelosi. There's a lot to say about this. First of all, I think that labeling them the Fraud Squad, I think that that goes too far. But with that in mind, I don't think that anger at the squad is unwarranted. I think that anger at them voting for Nancy Pelosi Pelosi, irrespective of the circumstances, they have to explain that. And this is where communication comes into play, right? Okay, I get that there was no other left-wing challenger and the only alternative to Nancy Pelosi was a, a Democrat that was more conservative, right? Someone like Hakeem Jeffries or uh, Steny Hoyer. So I, I get that. I can rationalize their, their reasoning. And if they feel as if, you know, getting the uh, exceptions for Medicare for All and the Green New Deal under PAYGO to then force a, a floor vote on Medicare for All later, if they think that's enough, then that's fine. Like, I don't think voting for Nancy Pelosi makes them sellouts. If I were in Congress, would I vote for Nancy Pelosi? No, I would not. I would make sure I rally enough protest votes 
to make a big enough noise without making us susceptible to getting an even more conservative speaker like Sandy Hoyer or Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, but that's just me. But if they took the time and explained it to us, explained it to people, this wouldn't be that big of an issue. Do they go too far in saying they're the fraud squad who are critical of their votes for Pelosi? Yes. I even saw some people say, like, we need to primary the squad and... Um, that just is nonsensical because why waste your energy and, you know, a limited amount of resources and organizational power on primarying them when there are Democrats who are way worse? There are Republicans who are worse. So, you know, I, I think that that is too far. There are some people who were just like overly attacking Cori Bush on her first day in Congress when you also have Marjorie Taylor Greene being sworn in. And why isn't your fire being directed towards her? She definitely doesn't support Medicare for all. So, you know, that's my feelings. But I'm also conflicted because when people run on something, like the expectations are higher, like the standards for the squad are higher, right? So I expect better from them. So if they let me down, I'm going to be more disappointed than by something that Marjorie Taylor Greene does or some other corporate Democrat does because I expect better from them. So here's the thing. Basically, if they voted for Nancy Pelosi and then explained themselves, that would be really, really helpful. It would make it so that way disillusionment and disappointment with the squad wouldn't be as severe. Because here's the thing. If you're going to make this vote, we all kind of expected them to make this vote. You've got to take the time to explain yourselves. But they vote for Nancy Pelosi and then they expect people to, to just accept. Well, we had no other option. But explain that to us. Like if you're going into Congress and you're Cory Bush and you support all the policies that we support, you can't just vote for Nancy Pelosi and then like never touch on that. Like if I did like a 30 second ad in Lo for Lockheed Martin on this show, a defense contractor, and then just never address it again, you guys would be like, what the fuck? Why are you doing this? What you just did is antithetical to everything that you stood for. So you'd have to explain yourself. And I think that maybe if I came up with some excuse or whatever, that would at least let you know my thinking. But we know, like, if you are a member of the squad, you know that Nancy Pelosi is antithetical to everything that you stand for. You know she's a fraud. So you can't just vote for her and not expect people to be angry. You have to explain your vote for Nancy Pelosi. Communicate with people. You have large platforms. You can go basically on any channel. My channel, uh, the, the Young Turks, Kyle Kalinske, David Dole. You can go on any channel and explain yourself. You basically have an open invitation. But this isn't even about leftist commentators. You could just upload a video to YouTube explaining, look guys, I understand why you're frustrated. Nancy Pelosi does not represent represent what I like, but I had to vote for her because that was the only way I could get X, Y, and Z. I could get this committee appointment, this concession. So I hope you can understand that I had to make this decision begrudgingly, but it's what I think can best improve my position in Congress to have more bargaining power. Like if you explain it to people, that would make matters a lot better, but there's no communication. They make the vote and people are scratching their heads wondering why you just voted for Nancy Pelosi. And perhaps, again, the reasons are valid because there isn't another option that's more left-wing than Nancy Pelosi. But explain to us what happened, why she's the speaker again, why during the last two years that you had, you didn't find the time to rally around someone else who's to the left of Nancy Pelosi, especially now that you have more leverage when the House just lost ground. Like, you... You just kind of like accepted Nancy Pelosi as an as an inevitability. So I want you to explain to us what happened. And it's not like they're forced to explain themselves to me. Like they don't have to come on the humanist report every single time they do something bad or that I disagree with. But if you want people who helped you get to Congress still be dedicated to you and, and fight for you and be loyal to you, you do have to clue them in on these things. You have to explain these things. Because we're not going to be privy to all of these small little legislative maneuvers and backroom deals that go on that leads to the things that are disappointing. So you just got to explain it to us. Like what we need from members of the squad is reassurance that what we're doing is, is worthwhile. Getting more progressive members elected to Congress is worthwhile. Phone banking for them, canvassing for them. Uh, you know, sending them money, that it's all worthwhile. Because if every time we elect someone and we primary a corporate Democrat successfully, you just turn around and do what the establishment wants, like people are going to get demoralized and the squad isn't going to grow as easily. So you've got you've to help us help you. The online left is just like one component of 
the overall left collective in the United States. But like it or not, they did get you elected. They helped you get elected. So you can't just make them feel as if once you're elected, that institution is going to change you. You have to explain to us that everything that we've been doing for the last couple of years, you know, it wasn't for nothing. You still know that Nancy Pelosi is the enemy and you let us know, you clue us in on these things. But like, there's a lot of things that kind of add up and people think it's trivial, but I don't think it is trivial. Like you see Na uh, Nancy Pelosi be called Mama Bear by AOC. Uh, you see AO or, or Ilhan Omar sharing an endorsement of Nancy Pelosi and what she said about Ilhan Omar. It's like, you can't, you can't do that and not make people upset because Nancy Pelosi is a barrier to progress. And if you really believe in everything that you say you believe in, which I believe you do, then you can't keep normalizing Nancy Pelosi. If you're going to vote for Nancy Pelosi, take the time to explain to people why she's part of the problem, why it's not just Republicans who are stopping us from getting Medicare for all. It is individuals in the Democratic Party's leadership that do that as well. But still, having said that, though, it doesn't mean that if you vote for Nancy Pelosi, you're a sellout or if you call her mama bear or, you know, you share her endorsement of you. That doesn't mean you're a sellout. It irritates me to no end. It does, but it doesn't mean you're a sellout. So I kind of see like both sides here. Like I see them going too far in saying they're the fraud squad, but also the anger and disappointment with the squad, it, it really is warranted. Like there's so much at stake, even if I'm misguided and the, the squad really is behind the scenes doing everything in their power to get us in a better position, the communication there is lacking. And we have to talk. But I want to end with this. Everyone who was involved and forced the vote, whether you supported it or you don't support it, everyone has good intentions here. Everyone is passionate because they believe this will either help or hurt our chances of securing Medicare for all further down the road. Because nobody believed this would lead to us getting Medicare for all. It just was a means to an end eventually. Maybe. But at the end of the day, we all support Medicare for all. And we're mad because we care. And that sounds corny, but it's true. Like, we're mad at each other. We're taking shots at each other because so much is at stake. And the left, you know, it seems like we're unreasonable and we're crazy because we're always, like, fighting each other and shitting on each other and dunking on each other. But that isn't just unhinged behavior. I mean, well, sometimes it is. But <laughs> that energy is there because people care. People's lives are at stake. People need Medicare for all. We need free college. We need a Green New Deal. So whenever, you know, the stakes are that high, emotions and tensions are going to be high as well. And we have to remind ourselves of that. Of that. And I feel like if I didn't like take this break from Twitter, I would probably be like right in the trenches, like staking out a position, arguing with everyone else, because that's just how human beings are. Like we, we say we support something and then somebody responds. And rather than trying to, you know, uh, interpret what they're saying from the position of a good faith ally, we kind of like harden our stance and we take shots at them and we feel attacked personally when that's that's not the case. Like the force to vote people, they have to acknowledge that the people who didn't agree with the strategy are not sellouts. But I think that tensions wouldn't be as high if political commentators like myself didn't fan the flames. Like I feel like all of this has kind of led to me coming to this conclusion that political commentary online is, is like a double-edged sword. On one hand, I think it is important because we, I think, I hope, provide a service in simplifying political news and giving you like an interesting take and offering you commentary that is insightful. But on the other hand, you know, like it or not, these personalities kind of become larger than life and people end up supporting the personality over the substance. So, you know, you, you see like when these personalities clash you know the audiences will clash and it becomes about the personality and not the issues and so i hope that like folks like jimmy Dore and jenk uger will stop taking shots at each other publicly for the betterment of the movement and like work this out privately but i feel like we all have to try to be more understanding of each other and empathetic and acknowledge that we're all good faith actors come coming from a position that um it's like well-intentioned